Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to our panel discussion on the 2019-20 Australian bushfire season. I'd like to start off with, um, in the spirit of reconciliation, acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and, the connect and their connections to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Good afternoon again, my name is Moritz, Moritz van der Vlucht. I'm a director at Mercury Project Solutions and I will be your host for this afternoon's discussion. Before we go on, a few housekeeping messages. Um, you're all on mute. Please keep your microphone on mute um, uh, until um, you've been asked to um, make a comment or ask a question. If you have any question, please raise your hand. There is a raise hand button at the bottom of your, bottom of your screen, and we'll ask you to then unmute and post the questions to our panelists. Um, we only have limited time, 30 minutes, so if we can all, and that includes myself, please be brief and to the point, that would be much appreciated. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Firstly, uh, Boon Boon Law in the blue shirt. Uh, he recently completed his PhD in spatial science and remote sensing at the University of Adelaide. He's a resident of Kangaroo Island and is currently working with a University of Adelaide research team looking at the effects of last summer's bushfires on nearshore coastal systems. Um, and then you may remember that Kangaroo Island was particularly hard hit in last summer. Our other panelist is Lou, Lou Short. He is a highly regarded expert in bushfire planning and design with over 20 years experience in local government, the private sector and state government with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and Emergency Management Victoria. While at the Rural Fire Service, Lou designed and rolled out the Fires Near Me app, which you may know, which has become a game changer in the use of spatial data for community access to emergency information. So welcome Lou, welcome Boone. Thank you. Pleasure. So as you may know, um, on the 30th of October this year, just over a month ago, the Royal Commission into Nat National Natural Disaster Arrangements, also known as the Bushfire Royal Commission, tabled its final report in the Australian Parliament. It con contains no fewer than 80 recommend recommendations that provide advice on the coordination of all levels of government during emergencies, warning systems for the public, firefighting resources, climate data, the role of the Australian Defence Force and how charities and other groups can best respond in the wake of disasters. Um, relevant for us though, is that several for, of the recommendations specifically address um, information management and failure, failures in information management and spatial data issues. Um, so we'd like to explore um, here today what these recommendations mean for our sector, what opportunities they may represent um, and we'd like to discuss that with you and our panel today. So let's start with you, Lou. Um, one of the things the Royal Commission noted is that from a quality standpoint, data consistency was essential to facilitating effective monitoring, reporting and informed decision making. And that's a quote. And using a national data set where possible ensures that data has agreed definitions, methodologies and standards to allow comparison. Comparisons. Now that seems pretty obvious, um, yet the Commission is making this recommendation. Is, is enough being done to standardise data? And, and how does the situation now uh, compare to where we were, for instance, in 2009 after the Black Saturday uh, Royal Commission? Yeah, th thanks, Morris. Look, I, I've been out of government for a few years now. Um, so I'm a little, little bit removed from it, but I, I think the difference from 2009 is that there's been huge advances in data um, management, data gathering, data integration across a range of different disciplines. Um, it tends to be driven within the states and territories, um, and then the Commonwealth, of course, sits over the top of that. So you, you've got a little bit of, you know, how data is being collected, that there's, you know, data standards within the agencies, and then to try and actually integrate that at a national level is actually incredibly complicated. Um, for the fire danger rating system, which is a, a big national level project, we 
I think about 12, 18 months ago, had the first nationally consistent vegetation layer across the country. You mm. know, you know, you would think that as a, a cornerstone of what you need to do. Um, and it took an incredible amount of work from each of the agencies and people to actually standardise it, translate it, test it, mm. get it working. Um, so it's it, it probably seems like a relatively easy thing to do. Um, but it requires a huge amount of coordination and control to actually get it to, to the point that it needs to be and, and release of control from the agencies to open their data up, get through licensing agreements, get through licensing agreements with um, software providers and things like that. So it, it, at a technical level, it's actually quite difficult. Uh, interesting you say that because I was just about to say that it sounds to me like the technology is there, the standards are there, um, but it's more of a governance and institutional uh, problem. Uh, or is it is it technically challenging as well? Uh, I, I think it was for, for the financial rating system, it was technically very challenging. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding, you know, if you, you've got multiple different versions of national parks or land managers across the country that have to bring all of their data together, translate it across, get an agreed national position, and then those agencies move away from what their, their standard data is. So it, it was actually very complicated in that the licensing agreements around the, the release and use of data took a right. lot of years to get through as well. So it, it's certainly not insurmountable, Morris, and it, it, it is the financial rating system was a nationally significant project, so there was a lot of cut through with it. Um, and you need to have those data people on board and the imprimatur from the organisations to put the time to it, because otherwise they're busy fighting fires and doing floods and mm. doing everything else under the sun. Um, and it, it requires quite a big effort. Right. OK, thank you. Uh, Boone, if we may um, switch to you. Um, you and your family, you live on, on Kangaroo Island and you have some pretty um, strong first-hand experience um, when you were present there uh, during the fires this past summer. Um, what what new information and fire surveillance data was available to you, dare I say, in the heat of the moment? And how useful was it? Um, was there any other information that you think that could be useful wasn't available? Uh, would you like to elaborate just a little bit on your personal experience there? Sure, I will, and thank you um, for having me here. Um, I really appreciate um, Lou's viewpoints there because uh, I had a real sense of never having, having never worked in the government. I was a real outsider to this, and it was really just a community effort trying to pitch in where you could because you know we're fairly isolated here on the island, and mm -hmm. the uh, anxiety, the collective anxiety amongst everyone was palpable. Um, so my viewpoint about accessing data as an outsider, um, uh, I found it a little um, frustrating because I, I appreciated the licenses. I couldn't uh, get the data, and, and I felt like I needed to use my skills in some sort of a positive way. And I don't have a background in fire mapping or, or area mapping, um, but I, I'm a researcher, and I dove in. I started uh, reading everything I could. And I relied on online communities, which is something that probably wasn't as strong in the 2009 bushfires. Um, now there's this collective uh, community out there innovating code. You can use Google Earth Engine, the Sentinel browser. And, and through that community, I was able to um, access codes, trial and error, and create burnt area maps um, for the island. And, you know, it's, you know, with my remote sensing background, knowledge of the island uh, terrain and, and friends that were out in the field, I was able to start um, handing them um, maps and things I was producing to find out um, the accuracy. And then as things escalated, um, it became um, friends that were um, fighting um, with very little resources because they had broken into farm units, which meant they weren't uh, being able to access all of the state support, um, including Intel. Um, and then I found out the maps I was producing was becoming part of their, was becoming part of their daily 
um, debriefs in the morning because they could look at burnt area maps to get an idea of what area of vegetation had burnt previously and based on the wind conditions that day where they could best uh, apply their resources. Um, and then word went around the community as it does and then uh, ecologists and other mm -hmm. members uh, of the community contacted me and, I, and next thing I knew is state agencies were contacting me and I thought well I should just present this information because it complements the good work mm -hmm. they're doing and, and this is not to say that good information is not out there it's just different information and so from my mm -hmm. standpoint I'd just like to see some different forms of information that are out there because you have the Sentinel hotspot stuff going on, which is fantastic. A apps like Lou is created, which is fantastic. And, and of course, the CFS always does a great job of the fire perimeter mapping. They did a great job mm -hmm. communicating. So it's really about presenting something different, but useful in different ways to the community. I'd like to see more of that as an outsider. So is, is, is it really sort of a grassroots movement of, of the community stepping into the bridge to sort of filling the gaps that that um, appear in the official information provision? Well, you know, I think it's something you have to be careful with. Uh, and Lou, I'd love to have your insights on this. Um, because one thing I was uh, very conscientious about um, was who's presenting the information and how accurate is it? And um, I always made sure that any information I communicated, I put a disclaimer to look to the CFS and the government authorities. Um, sure. And that you know, information should be used appropriately. So in a grassroots level, I don't know if it's a great idea to have internet warriors out there producing different maps and throwing things out to the world. You need to have experts. But maybe there's a forum in the future um, that this sort of information could be presented? What do you think, Lou? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, it, it's, a, um, it, it's a challenging one, and I think Moritz and myself might have spoken about this about 10 or so years ago, probably more, Moritz. Um, huh. I, I think the, 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 the challenge is to get authorised information that's accurate, up-to-date, that is reliable, um, and, and I think I, I used to call it, I, I would be concerned about people cannibalising information so that you had lots of different areas that people were going and you never really knew what was the right one to be getting the best information. Um, mm. So, you know, I, I get that in times of need people pitch in and, and you, you sort of mash up and, and do various things to fill the gaps. Um, mm. That's... It's an unusual year in 2019 and the, that, that fire season because the, the fires were so big, so ferocious over such an extended period that the agencies might have struggled to actually keep up with it. Um, but on any, any normal day of the week, they, they'd be fine with it. But it's on those really big events where the, the, the system starts to break down a little bit and you, you don't get those updates and people get frustrated and feel as though they've got to jump in and do things differently. Um, I, I tend to think that the, the ability is for agencies to gather and assess and do something with the data and spit it out in a really fast way is the, you know, something they really need to be stretching for. Um, and whether that's, you know, getting more people on board to actually analyse and assess data or you just get rid of the gates and you, you push it out. So once you get a line scan of a fire, it gets done processed and spat out and the data feeds are spat out as well so people can actually do other things with it. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a massive control freak in that sense and I, I did a lot with actually getting rural fire service data feeds out to the community, which I think is really important. I think, you know, you know, the fire sensor or a flag, you, you've sort of got to have that one source of truth almost that you go to that, People know you have rural fire service, fires near me, New South Wales, that's the spot. Yeah. But, but perhaps there's an 80-20 rule there, right? So that, that will do in 80% of the cases, but in those big crises where uh, the information flow is overwhelming and, um, and, and people need to be able to take uh, decisions really fast, um, perhaps then sort of a community-driven 
uh, approach can can sort of augment what's there. And and if you got information from your neighbors and from the from people 10 kilometers down the road and you happen to know them, and that can be sort of, as you say, mashed up, um, you know, I think there's a time and place for that as well. Uh, look, thank you. I'd just like to repeat to our audience, um, if you have any questions to Lou or Boone, um, just uh, click the, the little hand icon on the bottom of your screen that says raise hand. And uh, we're happy to take uh, take questions from the room. While we do that, ah, there's one from Sissy. I'm not sure, can you um, unmute you guys, yourself? Yeah, so uh, hi everybody. Great to see you here. Uh, thank you for coming. I have heard um, several times you're mentioning accurate, accurate, accurate information. Uh, and accurate data. But I have been working for many years with emergency responders and I hear them very often saying that it's good to have information, even if it is not that accurate. So according to you, what is how to classify the information in such a way to be able to to be useful uh, for the communities? Is it information like, OK, uh, three kilometers further on the road, there is something happening, there is a fire starting, or you want to know the exact location and mm -hmm. you wait for some data that provide you with the exact location? So how do you see this, this question, mm -hmm. <laughs> this dilemma? To wait for the correct data and accurate data, or just to have data to be able to be prepared and to know how to react. Lou, you seem keen to respond to that one. <laughs> I've, I've got a pretty uh, lowbrow low answer to that one, Sissy. Um, I I would always look at the best available data that you have, and, and to put that out. So you know, getting getting something out is better than having nothing at all. And then you tighten up the data as you go and you, you get better, tighter, more accurate information as it goes. But the, the, the most important thing is you're actually getting information out there. That, mm. you know, it, so the point data for a fire starting, for example, then triggers off the emergency alerts, warnings and things like that. So the, the point might be out, but you've actually started the process off. Um, so I, I don't have a hard and fast definition of best available information, um, but you know, I, I tend to think some some information that is verified. You've still got to have someone which is sort of authorising and saying, "Yep, that's that's right." We're confident in that. Whether as Boone said, it's sentinel for fire starts, or you know, you get a, a cab call from a um, fire dispatch or something like that. Um, but I, I think getting stuff out there as quickly as possible. Yep. Most important thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Boone, in your personal experience with with the situation on Kangaroo Island, would some kind of rating system, a confidence rating system, of all the information out there, um, being helpful and at all feasible? <laughs> well, um, look. I mean, ideally, it's great that. Um, considering the time pressures we were under, I was trying to produce the information as quickly uh, as possible. Um, uh, to answer uh, Sissy's question, uh, the way that I tried to test the accuracy of my data is I used different types of satellite imagery. I was luck lucky that Landsat and Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 crossed over more or less at the same time on the same day, so I was actually able to compare um, the data sets in that way to feel confident about the results. I also got um, uh, also spoke to my my farming friends out there who were all over the place in their utes, and um, they were giving me feedback on how accurate it was. And you know, I discovered some of the inaccuracies or known things like um, tall tree canopies. You know, the optical imagery can't penetrate, so you get these green treetops. But they knew they could tell on the ground because they knew the country. They knew uh, they knew that that was a big blue gum plantation, for example, is also obvious when it's a big square uh, on the map. Um, so, you know, that that's the, the best way I knew about accuracy, but to validate it, 
I don't know of a, a method to do that uh, quickly. Um, uh, if, unless you guys have some ideas, I'm very interested. Yeah. Look, there, there's plenty of examples in the open source community um, and, and in other communities where the, um, the reliability of a piece of information is essentially linked to the, um, the social credit and the reputation of the pro, um, creator. So if they have a history of, um, you know, providing reliable information, you know, a, a, a tweet or a map or something that put out would be, you know, higher rated than if you're a newbie who's never put out something. Uh, so that's that's perhaps uh, an angle um, that that could be could be looked at. And, and you know, then there is all kinds of things you can do with AI um, and <laughs> do essentially fact checking perhaps automated fact checking. Um, anyway, um, I'll be keeping an eye out um, for any other people who might be putting up their hands. Um, but um, uh, while we do that, um, the uh, you, you mentioned uh, a, a plethora of, of sources, um, including satellite providers. Um, is there a limit to the availability of data um, that uh, that we can have access to in, in these crises. Are you asking me directly, Moritz? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> whoever, whoever fits the shoe. Okay, um, for me, um, I think that there's a, a abundance of free information out there. I I, I welcome um, any new information we could get. Um, the challenge is, uh, as, as spatial scientists, is how we can turn it into something usable for the layperson. Um, so the more that's out there, the more options you have. So uh, I, I see no limit to it. I think um, I, I, I tend to be a little bit more cautious with the Moritz. Um, if, if you think about the, the emergency organizations, they are it's a very command and control hierarchy based system that they want to have trusted approved sources mm -hmm. they they're getting good feeds from and things like that um and i i think in the heat of the moment during fires or whatever it might be to start ingesting new data would present more problems um they should have a lot of those things streamlined before fires mm -hmm things like that to actually make it easy and they know where that they're pulling things in from. Um, yeah. I, I tend to think that, and it, it's practice from the, the agencies, that they, they tend to start locking down as they go into summer, be it for storms or floods or fires or whatever it is, that they simplify their environment and streamline as much as they can to make sure they're not getting any glitches or any unusual things. Um, yeah. if, you know, incorrect information out to, to communities or that might slow up what their existing processes are. All right, thanks. Yeah, that's interesting, Lou, um, because I, I ran into that hierarchical chain of command because I really, um, I, I contacted everybody I knew in the country fire service here. And, um, you know, and I respected it because I didn't want to step on the toes and the good work um, they were doing. but. You know, in regards to the outcomes of this Royal Commission, um, maybe there's some middle ground there. Maybe there's a, some sort of a portal that um, could be, uh, you know, our agencies could overlook to release that one-stop shop, whereas this information is processed and verified. It could be an authority um, to come out of it. Um, I'd like to see that maybe... God forbid, when there's another horrible incident and we have another conference like this and talk about this in another 10 years' time, maybe there'll be some uh, nice new things like that. Yeah. Um, we should take this uh, offline as some experiences that uh, that we can share here, uh, Abun. Um, Mohammed, uh, you have your um, hand up. Do you have a question? Um, yes. So. I wanted to know, like, do, uh, does the vegetation type matter when you guys are doing uh, assessing the fuel and for hazard reduction burn, especially? What is the priority of uh, knowing the vegetation type? Like, is it a real big factor when we are doing the hazard reduction burn? 
Yeah, th- thanks, Mohammed. Um, the vegetation is the the, the key piece. Um, certainly, with all of the the fire spread models now, so mate, all of the agencies would use um, fire prediction models, um, and so that national fire danger rating system review with the vegetation sets was all about getting standardised veg so you can get the models cranking and and get them going. So the Understanding the vegetation and having accuracy there is very important. Um, the, the better data you have, the better the models will be, the better you understand the rates of spread and all of those sort of things. Um, from a hazard reduction side of things, um, the, the most important thing is type of vegetation, so whether it's forest, woodland, grassland sort of thing, and then time since fire. Um, so the longer areas are unburnt, the hotter they burn once they then get fires into them. Um, so it's a, a very important piece. And one more question actually. Um, when the hazard reduction, when you guys are conducting the hazard reduction burn, uh, you want to know that at what location there is higher, like at this location, there is this type of vegetation. And so what kind of tools do you guys use to know that at this position, we have this type of vegetation? Is there a map or you guys just go to the site and take a sample? Uh, it, it's probably a combination of all, all of those things, Mohammed. Um, oh. You start, start with the map, so the time since fire, fire history, all of those sort of things that inform where to burn. Um, the fuel accumulation curves will give you roughly what the vegetation fuel load is going to be, and then you verify when you go out to write the documents up and then when the crews go out to actually do the burning. And that they will note areas of heavy fuel or areas to be, you know, you, you don't want to burn riparian areas and things like that. So that there's a pretty big process, you know, st- again, starting very broad and coming down to when you're starting to light up hazard reduction burns of, you know, what, what you look for. Okay. And how long does this process take, like when you guys are making this uh, decision? That they, they can be pretty quick. It, it's sometimes pretty quick to actually get the areas sorted out. So, you know, it could, could be couple of months, so you've got to go through a process to get them signed off and, and things like that. Um, the actual execution of the burns is more about resource availability and weather, and if, if it's too wet or too dry or too hot, too cold, all those sort of things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Uh, Thank you. Uh, a, lengthening, a lengthening bushfire season there doesn't help, does it? No. Um, all right, thanks for that. Um, I'll, I'll squeeze in one last um, quick question. Um, back to the satellites, I guess. Australia does not currently have its own Earth observation satellites, and therefore it relies on satellite imagery through partnerships with foreign-owned satellites. Bushfire Regular Royal Commission doesn't really address this issue as uh, potentially a critical um, uh, reliability. Um, do you think it would be worthwhile for the Australian government to look at uh, investing in a dedicated natural disaster satellite system while we find just uh, piggybacking on what um, foreign governments can provide us? Who would like to uh, tackle that? Mark, I think that this is um, uh, an amazing um, opportunity for the new Australian Space Agency. I think mm-hmm. that, um, and there's already, I think, some movement going on in that area. I really don't want to uh, uh, speculate because I have nothing to do with the Australian a- Space Agency and I'm no authority, but I am a fan. And um, <laughs> I do know that um, CSIRO, for example, right now has uh, is, is doing a joint venture on the new Nova Star satellite, which I think could have some um, uh, bushfire implications for Australia, right. which uh, is exciting um, because of course, uh, with the synthetic aperture radar, we can penetrate cloud cover. Um, but I think the new space agency should seriously look at our own dedicated satellite with optical and active sensors on it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, the, we, we go back to that fundamental question of, you know, better, more accurate data is the, the, the driving piece of good information to communities to make good informed decisions. Um, you know, the, the 
bit better lights. Satellites is just a, you know, it should, should be a no-brainer, I would think. Should be a no-brainer. Okay, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you very much for your insights, Lou and Boone, and thank you for um, all of you attending and asking your questions from the floor. Um, we just touched upon these things, looking at the, the, the inform different um, challenges around um, information quality, especially when it comes from grassroots sources. Uh, the importance of vegetation mapping, quality vegetation mapping, and wouldn't it be good if we had a few satellites of our own? Thank you very much for your time, and I wish everybody uh, a very enjoyable rest of um, the conference. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Max. See you later.